the book of Job, chapter 1, as all children up to 6th grade can be dismissed to their service, and the rest of us are in the book of Job, Job chapter number 1. We've been going through a series that we've been titled, Press Toward the Mark in Your Personal Walk, and we've been talking about different things that I believe are necessary as we desire to see God strengthen us and grow us. And this morning, we're going to preach in a message simply entitled this, Persistent Trust. Persistent Trust. We'll read the first few verses of Job chapter 1. You follow along as I read. The Bible says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Then there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. And his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen. And five hundred she asses in a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their homes, in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feastings were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Father, we love you. We thank you for the privilege you've given us to study this passage this morning. Lord, as we look through every aspect, not only will we learn, not only will we understand, but Father, the most important aspect, Lord, is we need instruction, or we need encouragement, we need challenging in our own personal walk. Father, trust, as we mentioned just a few weeks ago, is something we do not hand out easily. And Father, we have been taught so many times in our culture today reasons not to trust, even amongst religious institutions. And this morning, we need to be reminded that our trust is not in a preacher, in a church, even in the denomination, Lord, it is in you. And as we, Lord, come this morning and look at this passage, may you teach us, may you mold us. Father, I pray we listen on purpose. I pray we set aside distractions. And this morning, for the next 30 minutes, may you help us to understand what you have for us in these verses. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Trust, without a doubt, is one of the hardest things to give out today. Most of us have been hurt. So trusting is something we, not, we choose not to do. Some have seen marriage struggle, so they don't want anything to do with marriage. Some have seen um, preachers or religious people take advantage of their position, so again, they struggle trusting anybody. I've talked to many atheists when I ask them if they had a religious background, and most of them say somewhat of a religious background. A lot of them have had a Catholic background or something where a religious leader took advantage of of their scenario, and therefore they grew to hate God because of a religious institution. Some of us today, some people, uh, struggle in their Christian walk because they see other Christians who really don't stick with it. They see other Christians who really don't see it important. And so when a teenager sees another person who really doesn't find it important, they say, well, if it's not important to them, uh, then why should it be important to me? And we find a thousand excuses as to why that is. Why is it so many Christians seem to fall away and to change who they claim to be for so long? They claim to love the Lord. They claim to serve God. They claim that was the most important thing. And now, however many days, years, weeks later, they want nothing to do with God. Or they claim they can serve and love God and still live in outright sin and think that God's okay with it. And they have a skewed view of what God wants. One of the reasons I believe it is, is when God allows things to come into our lives, we don't always understand it. And so we get frustrated and our human nature takes over, as we talked about in Proverbs a few weeks ago. And because of that, we begin to quit. Well, Lord, you didn't do this, so I quit. And we have what I believe to be a wrong view of God. I come to God because he should do for me. And as long as God is doing for me, then you know what? I'm going to follow him. I'm going to serve him. That's a good thing. But the moment I'm not getting what I think I should get, at that point is when I say, you know what? I'm done. God, it didn't work. You know what? You didn't take care of my need, and and you didn't give me extra, and I'm in really personally, financially, no better situation now than I was when I started coming to church, so I quit. Or I came to church, and I really thought that the church would heal my family or fix my kids, and nope, it hasn't fixed, so I quit. I came to church, and it didn't really fit what I wanted, and so God, I'm moving on to something that fits me more. By the way, You can find churches that fit entertainment. You can find churches that appease. But when it comes down to it, ultimately, it's not about a church or about a pastor, about things like that. It's about whether you are going to make God, number one, whether you're going to trust him. Most of us are very familiar with the story of Job. 
And as we look through these pages, most of us are not going to be surprised by the story that we're going to read here in just a minute. But why is it that most of us struggle sticking with the stuff? Why? Simply ask this question this morning. We struggle sticking with the stuff when it just doesn't make sense. How do you stick with it when it just doesn't make sense? We ask questions like this. Why is God allowing this? What have I done wrong that God would let this happen in my life? We all want to see God work. We want to enjoy His blessing, but sticking with the stuff when it doesn't make sense is extremely complicated. So how do we accept God's plan when it really doesn't make any sense? Four things this morning we'll look at to answer, hopefully, that question from the life of Job. The first thing we see in this passage is we see divine bragging rights. We won't read the verses again, but in the first five verses, there is... A man by the name of Job. Now, what we see in these passages is this this story is a man who was very, very, very wealthy. And when he said he was the greatest man in his time, he was the wealthiest man in his time. Wealth wasn't always found in money, per se. It was found as much in possessions. So all the animals and all the farmland and the house and all the things he had. And then on top of all of that, God gave him 10 children. And so you look back and say, man, this man was blessed immensely. And you, why? Because in verse 1 it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Let me tell you some things about what that means, to fear God and eschew evil. When he said he was perfect and upright, that doesn't mean he never sinned. That means he was mature. He understood what was right. He, he, was, he was perfect. He was upright. He did what was right. He was not afraid to do right. He respected God and his laws. And eschewing evil means he stayed away from it. He understood something was evil, and he was not ignorant towards these different situations. And we think about bragging rights. Most of us like to have bragging rights. And we're growing up, we bragged on our dad. He was better than your dad or mom better than your mom or whatever it was. And and we got the coolest this, we got the coolest that. And I remember years ago, I uh, took a gentleman to our home. He would spend the night with us. And he, uh, his dad was a, uh, was a, God blessed him as well to do as a businessman and, and they had a beautiful, beautiful home. And we lived in a town home, which we, uh, we loved. And so we're, I'm taking him home. I picked him up and he got my car and, and uh, he got out of his fancy car and I'm driving a Kia Optima. He said, I'm in this thing small. I can barely move. I'm like, what, what are you doing, taking a bath or something? It's just a car. We're going somewhere. So we drive to our house and we get in and we walk in and he goes, How do you move around in this house? There's no room. He was just blown away at how he's used to this very large home. And he walked into a town home, and I honestly thought he was going to go claustrophobic. I felt so bad for the young man. And I took him to his room, and and he had his own bathroom and all this, and he was fine. And we we spent the weekend. His parents were out. We enjoyed the time together. uh, But he was just blown away by it. Why? Because, man, this is different. And he was saying, man, my house is this. And my house is he, never, he never criticized, but he was saying, well, I think my bedroom's bigger than your living room. And I said, I think your bathroom's bigger than my living room. That's okay. That's all right. We're good with that. And he just, he would brag on that. It was good. Good for him. God had blessed him. Some of us in the last couple of weeks, if you follow any sports, are already convinced the Eagles are going to win the Super Bowl because they clobbered three preseason games, right? And we're walking out. We're ready for it. And then guess what? They play the Jets and they lose. And now we want to fire Chip Kelly, get rid of Sam, you know, it's just how it is. You know, it's, it, we have bragging rights. I'm going to take him out. You know, my team's better than your team. And we like that. We like walking off a field if you're playing a sport. If you're like me, um, I like just about anything that you can win on, all right? If you can keep score, I like to do it. And uh, there's certain people I don't like to play against. My wife, when it comes to playing board games, I say this respectfully, and she would agree with this. She's vicious, all right? She wants to win, she wants to win badly, and when she wins, she'll remind you she won. And my father was laughing back there because he's been the brunt of the other end of this. And she'll sit there, she'll even start humming this tune, ha ha, I beat you, and I was laughing at you. And then she comes the next day, you want to play a game? Can I handle the humiliation tonight? Let's see here. I don't know. You know, but we love bragging rights. We love to say that we're better than someone else. But let me ask you this, imagine what it would be like for God to use us as bragging rights? In this passage, we'll see here in a second. Let's go to verse 6. The Bible says in verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God, this is the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered and said, and, uh, uh, and said, and From going to and fro the earth, and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? 
But there was none like him in the earth, a perfect man and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And Satan answered, and the Lord said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and all that he hath on every side that thou hast blessed the work of his hands? And his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. The first thing we see is a testimony before God. The Bible says he was an obedient man. He was a reverent man in the aspect of being fearing of God. He was sensitive. You know what? I should stay away from this. I'm sensitive about what's right. I'm sensitive about what this can do. And so because of that, I'm going to be very careful to stay away from certain things, being sensitive about. Let me tell you something. I hope we're more sensitive about some of the things that we get involved in. Sometimes you're going to get encouraged or asked to do something, and there's this part of you that says, I, I just don't have peace about it. Do you know that can be the Holy Spirit saying, just don't do it? I was reading through a book, the parent of teens class is going through this. It's Carrie Schmidt's book on passionate parenting. If, you have, if you've got kids who are parenting kids or you've got kids, you need to read this book. A passionate parenting. And he talks about when making a decision. How sometimes do you make a decision to your kid when you don't always have a reason why? Let's say a kid comes to you and says, can I go to so-and-so's house tonight? And you, some of you, you, you think you're thinking about it. I don't know why. I have nothing wrong with the family. I have nothing wrong with the situation. There's just some part of me that says I can't let you go. And so you say, God has not given me peace about that. What kid can honestly argue that point? Now, if you come and say, you know, can I have dinner tonight? God hasn't given me peace about giving you dinner tonight. You know, we can take it out of context a little too far. But the sensitivity to God and say, God has just asked me not to let this happen, so we're just, we're not going to. There's been situations over the years that my children have been in our home where my wife and I have said, we just don't have peace about the scenario. To not long after find out why we did not have peace about the scenario. Uh, something happened that they would have been involved in, and we sit back thinking the Lord. And don't get me wrong, when I tell my kids I just don't have peace about this, they don't sit back and say, well, you know, that's great. We just want to honor the Lord. That's not usually what they do, Okay. They're like, you're a kid. That's not fair. That's not fair. What's the worst going to happen? What do you think I'm going to do? Blow the house up or something? You know, and they exaggerate it or things like that. As every kid does. I hope we're sensitive to what God has. He eschewed. He stayed away from things he knew was wrong. But then he had a testimony before his family. You see his care for his family? In the passage we first read, he was so concerned about the spiritual nature of his kids that he would wake up early and he would go sacrifice. He would sacrifice and worship for himself, and then he would make sacrifices for his children. And the passage says, in case they curse God. He said, there's a chance that my kids will not follow my belief. There's a chance that I miss something. And even though I did everything I was supposed to, there's a chance my kids are still going to say no to God. So I'm going to pray for him. I am going to spend time in worshiping, just asking God to intervene upon our family. I noticed this week, and there's a video out. Many of you have seen. How many of you have ever seen one of the movies uh, done by that church? I think it's Facing the Giants, Courageous, um, uh, Fireproof. You seen those? Well, that church put out a new movie. I just realized that this week and did not know it. And I watched the trailer to it. I love the premise behind it. The movie's entitled The War Room. And I skipped over it, not realizing it was one of their movies. And I watched the trailer. And the whole premise is this realtor is showing an older lady a house, or the real, old lady showing a realtor a house to sell it. And she was saying, this is my favorite room. And she opened up a closet, and it, she called it her war room. And there were papers hanging all over the wall, things she prayed for for her family. The realtor's marriage was struggling, and he, this woman talks the realtor into developing a war room to pray for the family. That's about all I know in the movie. Until I watch it, I won't know anything more about it. But I love the premise. How many of us are willing to, just like Job, I need to intercede for my children. I need to be on my knees. I need to be in a place where maybe they don't even see it. And I need to go, and I need to pray, and I need to show my love for my kids. They may not know it, for my marriage, for anything. And I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to work until I can. He was sensitive, and he had a testimony before his family, and he said, even if they curse God, I will do what I can to honor them. He had a care for his family, a consistency before the Lord. The Bible says, thus did Job continually, continually worshiping. How many of us would struggle with the extra because it's inconvenient? It would take extra time. I wouldn't be able to watch as much of my program or do as much of this or be involved as much in this because I spent extra time for my kids. How do we stick with the stuff? when it doesn't make sense. 
This man had, you know, we look at him and we say, well, he, of course God had divine bragging rights. He was wealthy. God blessed him. It's easy to honor God when you're being blessed. We'd all agree with that, right? It's easy when there's plenty of money in the bank, there's gas in the car, there's food in the, in, in the refrigerator, there's even chocolate in the refrigerator. I mean, there is all kinds of things. Everything you want is there, and, and, and your bills are paid, and you have some extra money, and you're getting along with the family members, even getting along with the in-laws. I mean, everything's wonderful, right? It's easy to honor God when it's like that. And that's what God, Satan, told Job, Satan told God. God said, have you seen my servant Job? And he goes, well, of course he's blessed. Of course he does right. You have blessed him. Anybody blessed like him and protected like him is going to honor you. Take away his material possessions and see what happens. You know what Satan knew? That a lot of us honor God as long as we think he honors us. And the moment we lose those things that are so valuable to us, as Christians, it's dangerous for us. We can easily begin to blame God. God. It's gone because God did something. So we see the divine bragging rights and number two, the, an amazing reality. An amazing reality. Well, first of all, we see the strategy of Satan. Think about this. Satan came before the presence of God. We know that God kicks Satan out. He does not live there, but he can come before the presence of God. The Bible calls him an accuser. He goes before God and he goes up and he accuses you. And he, and he walks up and says, have you seen so-and-so? Do you see what he did today? So he will go out before God, and he will stand there, and he will point me out. And he said, you see that guy who claims to be a preacher at Rodney Love? You see what he did today? And here's the thing. He's not making something up. He watches me, and then he goes before God, and he tells me something. God already knows, by the way. And he says, how dare you love him? How dare you love someone like that? Look what he's done. But you know what the amazing part of this scenario is that we don't see in this passage? God, Satan accuses me. He's right. And as God is sitting there realizing he has to cast judgment, Jesus comes out and he puts out his hands and says, I've already paid for that. My blood covers it. It's taken care of. But yet Satan still goes. Satan still accuses. Satan is still massively fighting. Satan is the accuser. Satan is also the stalker. He's walking around the earth seeking whom he may devour, trying to destroy you. Why is it sometimes it's complicated? Because Satan is attacking. Satan is fighting. You say, I don't want that. I don't want to serve God because then Satan fights. If you're not fighting Satan, that means Satan's already won. You understand that? And one preacher said years ago, I've said this over and over, but I, it's a powerful truth that I think about. If you don't wake up every day facing Satan head on, it's probably because you're going the same direction. Well, we need to. We need to understand there'll be times that Satan's not going to like what we're doing. You know, Satan does not like the fact you're sitting in church this morning. He really, really doesn't. And he's going to fight you. He's going to give you a thousand reasons not to come to church. And you probably overcame some of those reasons this morning. You woke up and you had a headache and a twitch in your left eye. And then you got all that taken care of and you went to comb your hair and it just would not go. I mean, it's just gone. And so you can't wear a ball cap to church. What are you going to do? So you squeezed as much juice as you could out of that hair gel and you solved it or shaved it off. One of the two. All these things. And Satan's fighting. And then this week when you go to do right, Satan's going to give you a thousand reasons why you're wrong. Why you shouldn't do it? It's not worth it. An amazing reality is the strategy of Satan. Second of all, the trust of a Savior. God's protection of the godly. We see in this passage that Satan had no authority to do anything to Job unless God gave him permission. If something does come into your life, God is aware of it. God is in control of it. And God knows the end of it. You catch that? God is aware of it. God is in control of it, and God knows the end of it. God knows how it's going to end. God knows that Job is about to lose all his material possessions, but he knows that God, he's going to give it back to him. God knows in the next, se next segment that he will lose all his kids, and ki God will ki Satan will kill all his kids, but I'll give the kids back. He knows that later he is going to deal with a physical illness uh, of boils, one of the more painful things he can deal with, and God knows that he is going to heal him from that. God knows everything. You see, God, why would God let Job go through all of this? For the same reason, He allows certain things to come in our life to teach us, to draw us close to Him, and to get glory from us. You know that's why God desires, why God even created man, for us to give glory to Him. We come to church, we sing His praises. Why? To lift up His name. But that worship doesn't have to end on Sunday. I can go home and worship Him all week long, letting Him have me, me 
my life. And when trials come, I accept it. It's not easy. It's not something I enjoy, but I will let God have those things in my life because he promises to protect me. The Bible says that he placed a huge hedge around Job. He said, you remove that, let's see what happens. Well, as we've seen, divine bragging rights an amazing reality. Let's see what happens under a heavy load. Verse 13, and there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger into Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabins fell upon them and took them away, yea, and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and carried them away. Yea, and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, thy sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Under this heavy load, the first thing we see is a great loss. Let's look at some thoughts about this loss. He loses all of his animals, his camels, all those things. What is that? His money, his possessions, gone. He goes for literally within seconds, as far as he's concerned, from being the wealthiest man in that land to having no material possessions financially. I mean, it's one thing to have the stock market crash and lose some of the investment money we put into it. It's one thing to say, man, I've got to catch up. I've lost 6000 or whatever, how much I've lost or whatever you can lose. It's one thing. But it's another thing to say to someone to call up and say, everything that is part of your financial portfolio is gone. You have nothing except the shirt on your back and the house you live in. Nothing. It's all gone. Then as he's hearing about all of his material possessions disappearing. By the way, for many of us in our culture today, that would be the end. I say, God, get it. I give up. <laughs> you took away my internet. You took away my TV. You took away my car. You took away my credit card. You took away all this. What else is there to live for? You know one of the reasons God did this to Job is to prove to the world there is a whole lot more to live for than what's in my bank account. I think we need to be wise. I think we need to be smart. I think all of that. But when all comes down to it, tomorrow everything can crash and my bank account could be empty. But I serve a God who's not afraid of that. What do I do? When I, what, what, how do I stick it out when that doesn't make sense? Remember, when things don't make sense to me, they make sense to God. God will not let something into your life that He has not already equipped you to handle. I just need to let Him do what He wants to in my life. Then as he loses his material possessions, he finds out his entire family, all his kids, are gone. If you're a parent, inevitably at some point you've had a dream or a fear. Something happened to your kids. You're walking the mall, and you're looking at the part, you know, the clothes that bore kids, and they see toys, and they disappear. And now you're walking to the mall thinking, I've lost my kids. What am I going to do? And you're panicked. The worst panic is not only knowing that I hope I find my kids, but is he going to be escorted by a police officer who's taking me to jail because I wasn't paying attention to my kid? So you're walking around panicking. What's going to happen? I can't believe they walked away. And then you do what most parents do. You find them. My kid used to play hide-and-seek underneath, underneath the clothes racks. And so you'd, you'd find what everyone was moving. And you do. You pull them out, you know, the cute little bundle of four-year-old joy. And you hug them. And you squeeze them because you're glad to see them. And then you grab them and say, what are you doing? You've been there, right? And the kid's sitting there. Wrong rack? What did I do? Should I have hidden somewhere better? Next time I'm not going to get found, right? And you panic. You're scared. What happens? You know, that was one of the greatest fears of any parent. When we had kids, one of the things we did that wasn't an issue to that point was we started looking into a will. What if? At that point, as a youth pastor, we flew a couple times a year, sometimes to foreign countries. What if we didn't come home? That was a fear. We didn't think about that in the first two years of marriage. It was just the two of us. But now we have kids. Can you imagine, though, while you've heard about all the financial possessions you have gone, to turn around and hear that the one thing at least you had, your kids are gone. What an amazing loss. Horrible loss. James 4.14 says, What? Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? 
It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. Notice the timing of the loss. It happened probably at separate points, but Job heard all of these things in a matter of a minute. And the Bible says, as one was speaking, another one came up, another one came up. And so he's out there maybe talking to a servant, evaluating all that he has, and within minutes it's gone. Most of us don't lose everything. We have a tight struggle here or something like that. But most of us don't lose everything at one time. Why did God let Job do this? Because he knew what Job would say. He had a trust in Job, a persistent trust in Job. And he knew what he would do. One of the reasons God allows things into your life is because he trusts you to honor him with it. How do I stick with the stuff when it doesn't make sense? To know that he's trusting me, that he's empowering me, and he will help me through the battle that just doesn't make sense. This is when you learn how much you really trust and really follow the Lord is when he is all you have. When your money's gone, your retirement's gone, everything else is not there, and you have nothing personally to lean on that you've established, is God enough? Is God enough in your relationships? Is God enough in your retirement? Is God enough in your priorities? Is he enough? There's a lot of other things that God has blessed us with and allowed us to have. But I ask this question, is he enough? When nothing, I can't have anything else, is walking with God and what he's given me enough. Paul said this, I have learned in whatever state I am or situation I find myself in, therewith to be content. It's the hardest thing to do, to be honest with you, because we live in a society that says, get more, get more, get more, and God says we have to learn to be content. So how do we stick with the stuff when it doesn't make sense? Well, we see divine bragging rights and an amazing reality than this heavy load that went on Job. We'll finish with this, a tender heart. Verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this did Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Two things, and we'll finish here. We see, number one, an honest mindset. Some of I've heard people say that Job didn't. He trusted God so much he never struggled. This really wasn't that big of a deal. No, when you talk about the fact that he shaved his head and he ran his man and he fell down, that was the sign of massive mourning and, and, and horrendous pain. He came down in the greatest physical way he can. He showed people, I'm hurting. It's all gone. But here's the thing. In the middle of the pain, in the middle of the struggle, in the middle of the time when it didn't make sense, and all of that when it really hurt, he was honest enough to sit down and to ball and say, Lord, it doesn't make sense, but an honest mindset comes with the biblical mindset. The Bible says he charged God. He did not charge God foolishly. And I think that is an important thing for us to look at. He did not charge God foolishly. I know sometimes when I look at and I wonder why God's not doing something, you know what happens? Lord, I don't get it. Why aren't you doing this? And I get upset because God should work the way I want him to, right? I mean, come on. This is what he should do. I've established it. Why isn't he doing it? And I begin to charge God. In that case, it would be foolishly. I charge him for not being a good enough God because he's not done what I want. And it's so easy for us to fall in this trap. I tell you, it's so easy, especially, by the way, when trials are over your head. When you're in the middle of a storm and it doesn't make sense, Part of you thinks, I shouldn't have this problem. I'm a Christian. Man, God should be taking care of this. Why am I having this problem? And so we begin to charge God. Some people run from church. Some people say, forget about it. And they charge God foolishly. I talk to people who no longer come to church. And when I ask them what happened, when I witness to them, or maybe they've been here over the years, and I say, why do you stop going to church? And they begin to blame God for a list of bad things in their life. This is what he's saying. Job charged God not foolishly. He did not charge him foolishly. You know, we won't go into reading it right now, but later in the passage, there's a time when Job's wife comes to Job and makes this comment, just curse God and die. And he looks at his wife and he says, you speak as the foolish women do. Now let me explain. He wasn't calling her foolish. Basically, he says, this is what the carnal people do. You're speaking like the world. I understand your struggle. I understand. We all often forget Job went through battles, but so did his wife. Her security was gone. Her kids were gone. And sitting at this man saying, we've honored your God. We've honored God. What's going on? And she's getting the human thinking. It doesn't make sense. And he doesn't look. I don't think he looks and judges her. I think he looks and says, do you understand that your mindset is just like the world? 
As long as God is good to me, then I'm going to follow Him. But the moment He's not good to me, then I'm going to curse Him and die. He said, well, God's good to me. Why can't I honor Him when He's not? Why can't I honor Him when He's not? Blessing. How do we stick with it when it doesn't make sense? To understand God is fully aware of what's going on. God is completely in charge of what's going on. And God knows how it's going to end. And by the way, it will have an end. If I allow God to do what He wants in my life, if I come back to Him and I'm on my knees, we talked about last Sunday afternoon, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I get on my knees and I ask God forgiveness. I eschew sin as Job did and I come to Him. Then I can expect God to do something great. But if I don't, then I can expect God to allow me to live the way I want and see the consequences of my decisions. None of what we see in this passage was Job's fault. None of it was. His loss of money, his loss of kids, he was doing everything right and it was all taken away. It wasn't his fault. These men, these three men stood next to him, four men stood next to him. For several, for several days, they stared at him. Would you love it if you were in the hospital? All right, you've been in a car accident or something. It's not your fault. Someone came through. The uh, uh, were telling me one day I would pick him up. They were sitting up on the bridge over 95, and, and a semi-truck was pulling behind him, didn't see him, and just started crushing their car right up against the medium. Not their fault. You can't do anything about that. Can you imagine, though, if you're in a massive accident and you're laying in the hospital bed? You're healing, you're healing, you're hoping you'll be able to walk okay, and maybe Pastor Drew and I and Mr. Biscay come to visit you. Maybe we'll bring Brother Nobellini. The four of us will come visit. All right, we're going to grab four chairs, and we're going to sit next to you, and we're just going to stare at you. The doctors come and go, we're just going to stare. We're not going to talk to each other, we're just going to stare. We're going to sit there and say, can you imagine that, sitting there saying, what are you doing, this is awkward. You know, we're just going to continue to stare, we'll get up and go get lunch, let you rest, we'll come back and we'll sit down and stare some more. For several days, that's what these men did. They just stared at him in pain as the second round of punishment came of the boils. And then when they finally spoke, they said, you must have done something wrong to receive the punishment from God. Job did nothing wrong. Sometimes understand the way we can overcome when things don't make sense is simply this. It's not always my fault. Sometimes God just allows these things to happen. Now, by the way, sometimes it is my fault. Sometimes it is a result of sin. Sometimes it is a result of my carnality. Sometimes it is a result of the fact that I am not giving God what He desires. I'm not living in obedience to Him. I'm living a selfish, carnal way. And God says, fine, have your way. Those times are my fault. But when I can honestly say, I went before God, and I know this is not punishment, then how do I stick with it when it doesn't make sense? Because it's simply this, persistent trust. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it should have been solved, God is still in control. And your personal walk, as you take steps of faith, when God asks you to go soul winning, God asks you to tithe, God asks you to do certain things, and you say, I don't know if I can do that. It's not easy. Those steps of faith are complicated. How do we do it? Persistent trust. God has promised to take care of it, and I believe he will. God has promised to take care of it. And then watch. For those who wait, in Galatians, he says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And that's one of the most important parts. Don't quit. Don't quit because it gets hard. Don't quit because it doesn't make sense. Just don't quit. Father, we love you. We thank you for the time you've given us this afternoon, this morning. The privilege we have to be able to study your word. Lord, there are going to be times in our life when things that come our way just don't make sense. Lord, the pain, the hurt, the loss. And we sit and we wonder, and Father, even as Job, he struggled. He sat there and he mourned, rightfully so. But yet you said in all that time, he never charged you foolishly. Lord, that's one of the hardest things for us to do because our first reaction is, is we are mad because this should have never happened. And sometimes we want to blame God. But we have to remember that Satan is still attacking. Satan is still accusing us. He is still stalking us. He is still finding a way to make us miserable. And in all of that, he wants us to be miserable. Well, we need to know that you are aware of this. We need to trust. Well, we don't get to see the side. Job didn't get to see the side of the heaven that we get to see in the story. But Lord, we don't get to see that side ourselves, but we know it's happening. That spiritual warfare is still taking place. And this morning, Father, I pray you help us as we go through these battles to stick with it, to not quit. Lord, to exhibit persistent trust, even when it makes no sense. With your head bowed and eyes closed, please no one looking around. I want to ask 
a couple of questions this morning. If you're here and you've never actually placed your trust in Jesus Christ, first of all, for salvation. All the things we talked about are what we can trust in God. None of it could work. None of it's any good unless we've accepted him as our Savior. We must be in his home. We must be part of his family. And I'd like to ask you this morning, if you're not sure you're saved, I don't want to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to lift you up in prayer. I won't say your name. I just want to lift you up anonymously before God in prayer. And you say, Pastor, I'm really not sure I'm saved. But I'd like you to pray for me this morning. Again, I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. If that's you. You say, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you conclude me in that prayer, Pastor? If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'm not sure, Pastor. Would you pray for me? Anybody like that this morning? I'm not sure. Would you pray for me? I asked the second question this morning. Are you in a situation that just doesn't make sense? Coming out of one? Maybe you're going to find one in the next couple of weeks. Maybe as we're asking church for us to step forward and do some great things, Satan has thrown things into your life to make it impossible in your mind to do some of those things. And we sit back and say it doesn't make sense. In a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. If God has spoken to your heart, we need to come and ask God to give you grace, give you strength, to not charge him foolishly, to hurt as we will, to mourn as we might, but then to trust in him persistently and wait for him to bless. If you don't know the end of the story, Job was given double the possessions he had. He was given back the children as they were able to have more. And he was able to ultimately enjoy even double what he had before all this started. Why? Because he trusted God. I hope you're doing that this morning. And I hope you're trusting him that down the road, I don't know when, but down the road, he will honor you as you honor him. Father, I pray you bless in this time of invitation. I pray you work in our hearts. I pray you respond to you have us too. Lord, this is one of those that... Some of us are struggling in this room, and may we just come and give it to you. Maybe not fight the battles alone, but may we come and hand them to you and then persistently trust you to do what only you can do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together with